Yes, I had the Castle uh, test, and mine is a Type 2, which is not the kind I want to have. But do you all save any of the tissue that you received? If, if we can. So um, we, uh, and that was an enucleation or biopsy? Biopsy. Biopsy. Uh, we may or may not have that saved. So we, we essentially extract the nucleic acid, and based upon the sort of amount of melanoma biopsy that, that came, we will save if we can save it off. If we have to run it all for the test, we'll run it all. So if you want to talk to Kristen afterwards and give you your name, we can go and look it up in the system and say we have nothing or we actually have some. Okay. There's, see, there's a vast difference between type 1A and B and then type 2 as far as statistical probability of metastasis. That seems a Explain. huge jump. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, so it's, so that's that's an excellent question. So I think as some of you who might have been tested early on, it was really a initial, a very discerning class one and class two differentiation. And what um, what was what was found by Dr. Harbour and the physicians who were part of that prospective Coog study was that as you followed um, uh, the patients who were enrolled in that study out there were some patients who seemed to have sort of a later risk of developing metastasis and the first qu who were called class one. And the first question was, well, why is that? Is that because the test missed a class two? Um, did it suffer from the issue of maybe heterogeneity? So did we just get the wrong sample perhaps, which you know exists in all cancers and also in melanoma? Um, and so what, what was done at that point in time by Dr. Harbour's lab when he was still at Wash U in St. Louis was to say, well, let's go ahead and take these patients who metastasized who were class ones and see if they actually look like a class two. And so he did some other things like BAP1 testing, look at some other kinds of gene identifiers, uh, chromosome three testing, for example, BAP1 testing, other things to say, well, did the, did the class two call just miss it? And what he found with, with the uh, majority of the class ones that metastasized, which of course was still a very, very small number, they didn't have those class two phenotype features. And so he was pretty certain that it's probably a different process and a different time-related process. And so if you look at the numbers in the laboratory report, it does look like you have sort of a low, medium, high in terms of risk, I guess you would say. Um, but it's important to understand that the number of patients who are in that class 1B represent a small amount of patients who actually go on to metastasize. The data is just a little bit thinner. I think at the end of the day when he analyzes the next follow-up cycle for that original Coog study, what you'll see is the class 1As will be your, your lowest risk. The class 1Bs will actually come up as a population because you'll have more patients being followed longer. And the class 2s will be about what they are, which is to say that that's an aggressive tumor. Um, some bodies can fight that off, and as Dr. Singh said, keep it in balance, I guess you would say, between sort of a, is it going to metastasize, or can my immune system hold it in place, or whatever the mechanisms are. Um, and I think that'll hold, hold fairly stable. We just completed a second prospective multi-center study in the U.S. that will be submitted for publication here probably next week or the week after. And the data, um, good or bad, overlays exactly with the first data set from Dr. Harbour. So at least that's confirmation in a second study set that this is exactly kind of the same kind of output that we're getting. Did I answer the question or did I go way over? Okay. Hi. I have, um, I had the castle testing. I was diagnosed uh, in February. Um, it was confirmed. And I had the unique opportunity that my mother died of ocular melanoma. So uh, I'm and I was deprived, I liked his word, deprived of the extended genetic testing um, for whatever that is. Um, and I'm not really clear. I had blood work done for the genetic counseling, and I was called last week and told that I'm uh, out of the 45, whatever the profile is, for blood work, that I'm, I'm negative on all 45. So I don't show up BAP. I don't show up any of these things. And I don't know really what my next step is. Just one of your patients, right? One of my patients? No. <laughs> um, it's, do you know what test you had done or where it went? Well, I am going to follow up to see if I'm one of the people that they saved oh, the okay. tissue. That would be one piece. And then the other, I'm assuming you're asking about the blood work? Right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so UCSF, whatever they use. I'm sorry? UCSF. 
Yeah, I'm not sure what, so there are a number of different laboratories that offer hereditary cancer syndrome panels. And basically what they do is they use next generation sequencing, which is a type of genetic test where with one sample in one shot, they look at multiple genes simultaneously. And they basically look at those genes from start to finish and look to see if those genes are spelled correctly or if any of those genes have a mutation in them. Um, there are multiple different genes that are associated with cancer in general. Um, and so some labs have developed hereditary colon cancer syndrome panels. Some labs have hereditary breast cancer syndrome panels. Some labs have just hereditary cancer panels where it's just if a gene can cause cancer, no matter what type, it's on that panel. And so you may have had a test such as that where it looked at 45 cancer syndrome genes and you did not have a mutation in any of them. I'm speculating, I'd have to actually see the result in the report. What that means is that um, based on those genes, you don't have a hereditary cancer syndrome. Could you have a mutation in a different gene that maybe we don't know about yet? Absolutely. So, so. my last question on this piece is, um, can this assessment be done through blood as opposed to waiting until the metastasis occurs large enough? So I think that's looking at two different types of, that's two different questions. So one is what are your chance of metastasis, which is not necessarily linked to, okay, cl clarify your question then, please. The clarification, I'm sorry. That's the okay. clarification is blood work or wait until the tumor is large enough to be then biopsied. That's my question. So. Blood work I think for, what? For knowing whether or not you have a hereditary cancer syndrome? Yes. I mean, I would like to know what my, right now I'm in this boat where it's like, okay, well, I understand that I just needed, wanted to know, would blood work show up the possibilities of hereditary uh, future okay. and future That's treatment? Or am I waiting until metastasis occurs, which I'm class two, then I'm still waiting and then something maybe can be done. So I guess there's maybe a couple of questions that are teased apart. I misunderstood what you were saying initially. So maybe there's one question of saying, my mother was diagnosed with, with ocular melanoma. I have been two now, and I'm Castle class two. And you didn't quite say this directly, but I guess it's one of the questions saying, do I have one of these rare inherited forms that might have my brother, sister's offspring be at risk too? Is that part of the question? or? Well, they're already looking at that, and okay. as, as it is, none of the family members have shown anything. And okay. I don't want okay. to take all this time. So then the I, second I question is, is, the is the value of, of do I go ahead and consider doing ongoing blood work to pick up early metastatic disease as opposed to just relying on imaging surveillance and, and clinical um, management? And I think based on one, I think that's you and your... Oh, that's, wasn't I, think, I think there's separate. separate. Metas your metastasis development, if it would be completely... Separate, separate to whether you have a germline or an inherited predisposition, right. it, it, the management of your metastasis would be dependent on your metastasis. But your blood work, and as Megan said, I think you may have done the Dr. D'Amato's next gen study at UCSF, so yeah, maybe. We'll have time for one more question and then we got to wrap it up. I was wondering if both uh, Jamie and Derek could give us updates on uh, what second generation testing they're working on. Sure, we, we're actually considering, um, you know, moving forward, we do uh, the monosomy 3 genetic testing for 3, 1, 3, 6, and 8, along with the microsatellite analysis that'll detect your isodisomy. But we're thinking of adding a separate panel as a reflex option for doctors to include GNAQ, GNA11, BAP1, uh, EIF, 1FX, and SF3. And that will be a reflex option because as we move forward, we're realizing that the clinical trials are, are starting to explore those genetic mutations to stratify patients. So we're thinking of adding that in as a next level option for, for patients. The tricky part is getting enough sample. Um, Enucleation is often easier because you get a bigger, a bigger piece of DNA. Those fine needle biopsies 
Um, but we think we're doing very well. Our, our failure rate is very low, and uh, we're hoping that we can integrate that in with a new type of technology called the next generation sequencing. So that's what we're, we're stratifying uh, towards. So um, from a castle perspective, we have worked out being able to run those five next gen sequencing markers here that Jamie talked about on tumor tissue on a single biopsy specimen. Um, so that's something we'll go and make available here shortly. But the question really has been from a clinician standpoint, a patient standpoint, well, on the one hand, more information is better. On the other hand, if, it, if we can't tell what it means or how to act upon it, is that really information should be done on a routine basis? So I think that's something we're trying to work through. What's the right, what's the right approach, I guess you would say. Um, we're also expanding so that if there's an interest in doing either a 50 gene panel, 300 gene panel, we can also run that at the same time off the primary tumor tissue. Although again, the question is the actionability, I think, of that information. So I, I think we're kind of working through what the right approach should be so that we aren't uh, generating kind of a, an urgency of over-testing, but at the same time, we have the nu nucleic acid in the tissue bank and therefore wants to be run, will comply with whatever the patient and doctor want. Um, there's a new marker um, that um, I think Dr. Harville referred to as the, as the P marker assay. We've been working with that for about a year and a half or so. It's interesting. It, it may add some informative data from an outcome standpoint, but we're waiting to have that final piece of validation set down with a third party here to make sure what we report out is actually accurate, I guess, and that we'll kind of roll that out here towards the end of the year, early next year as well. And that sort of is that issue there. We do we do, do some um, germline testing, so that's what I got um, off, off track there. So um, as you know, um, the vast majority of patients who end up having a, a, a BAP1 mutation, it's a somatic, it's a tumor mutation, not a inherited one, but there are some, some of us who, who look like atypical uv melanoma patients, and I think there, there, there might be an interest to say, hey, I want to kind of rule out, is this a familial thing or not? And so that usually requires matched blood to be sent and, and to, with the tumor tissue either afterwards or later. So that's something we'll offer up. But again, that sort of is a, a unique special class of patients, I think, who just look like they, 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 they just don't fit the rest of us from a mold standpoint. I don't know if that answers the question or not. I think we're out of time. Um, give a round of applause.